Well, we're going to resume the meeting now. And we have a particular order. The city clerk. Yes, hello. Uh, <laughs> I've got hello, everyone. Uh, we're uh, resuming our meeting now. We are resuming the meeting now. So if you don't mind, uh, everyone, if we could. Uh, uh, we're resuming Ready the meeting. If you still want to have a discourse, please uh, feel free to engage in that outside of the council chambers. But for now, we're going to proceed with the uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Good evening. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Yes. Good evening, honorable deputy May mayor and council members. My name is Shoshana Aguilar, and I'm a management analyst in the Water Utilities Department. I'm here today to share why staff recommends ordinances amending portions of chapters 29 and 37 of the city code. Oh, time out. This is a public hearing. Uh, we need to do disclosures. Disclosures. Staff. Staff only. No contact. And Councilmember Feller isn't here. Uh, all materials have been provided to the council. Thank you, Clerk. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Please resume. We recommend amending Chapter 29, Article 9, regarding the regulation of commercial kitchen grease disposal into the city's sewer system, Chapter 29, Article 10, regulating other discharges into the sewer system, and Chapter 37, Article 2, to repeal a duplication in the code and in relation to how water meter size is determined. The city code needs revisions to align with current California plumbing code. One additional change is to allow grease control devices in the right of way. This will help development downtown, where there is often less space on private property for these devices. Changes are needed to Article 10 of Chapter 29 per audit recommendations from the EPA's pretreatment program. Moving on to the water side, Chapter 37, Section 37.37.1 .37 needs to be repealed to remove a duplication in the code. This section was last amended October 20th, 1999. For Chapter 37, Article 2, Section 37.56, the current code sets water meter size based on building type and the number of rooms. This was last amended in 1995. Staff recommends amending the code to determine meter size based on current fixture count tables in the California Plumbing Code. Fixtures are items such as toilets, showers, and sinks. This amendment would also bring the city in closer alignment with standards from the American Water Works Association. To provide more detail on the proposed amendment to Chapter 29, Article 9, this article demonstrates to regulatory agencies that the city has an aggressive strategy to eliminate sewer spills. The amendment would cause the code to better reflect current practice and the California Plumbing Code. As I mentioned previously, allowing grease control devices in the right of way will benefit downtown development. The revisions to Chapter 29, Article 10 are in regards to preventing pollutants from entering the sewer system and include updated definitions and the addition of a special user discharge permit to allow case-by-case -case groundwater discharge into the sewer system. The changes to Chapter 37, Section 37.56 will ensure that the water chapter of the code is consistent with development services methodology and will allow the city to follow changes in the California Plumbing Code in order to remain current. As for fiscal impact, since the city has not previously allowed grease control devices in the right of way, it is hard to anticipate the revenue that this will produce. A right of way permit and encroachment removal agreement will be required. The special user discharge permits may generate up to $890 per year, and no other fiscal impacts are expected for the remaining changes. To conclude, staff recommends that City Council introduce the ordinances amending Chapter 29, Article 9 of the City Code to regulate commercial kitchen grease disposal, Chapter 29, Article 10 to regulate discharge into the city's sewer system, Chapter 37, Article 2 to repeal a duplicate section of code, and Chapter 37, Article 2 to appropriately size water meters. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Would you have a seat there at the side? We have a couple of questions. Okay. This is a public hearing item. So any members of the public wishing to speak on this specific item, not, not the marijuana uh, ad hoc committee, but for this particular item, you can come forward at this time. Deputy Mayor Lowry, I see none. Okay, Council Member Sanchez. Close the public hearing. Close the public hearing. Cover your ears. Disclosures from Thank you. More disclosures. I have uh, uh, just had staff contact. Uh, move introduction of the ordinances. 
I'll second it. Okay. I, I just have a question. Okay. Am I up next? Councilor Sanchez, was that your only item? Did you want to speak on this? I just made the motion. That was it. That's, I'm just confirming that before I move on. Council Member Kern. Okay, it's my turn. I, I have a question on th the grease traps. Are we forcing people to put grease traps in the right of way, then charging them to put grease traps in the right of way? Um, Council Member Kern, we are not forcing them. Um, right now, it's not an option, um, and so we would allow it as an option. Um, sometimes private property, especially in the downtown area, is very tight um, for these devices. So they, it gives them the option to put it in the right of way, and, and they, they need a right of way permit to do that. That's great, and an encroachment removal agreement. Okay, that, I just want to make sure that that's clear that they have the option to actually put it within their own footprint and not have to do that. Okay, thank you. I just want clarification. I'm good. City Attorney. Thank you. I'll go ahead and title the ordinances before you vote. Uh, so if you could bear with me, there's three of them. This is the introduction of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Oceanside amending Chapter 29 of the Oceanside City Code by the amendment of Sections 29116, 29122, 29.124, .125, and .126 pertaining to the regulation of commercial grease, uh, I'm sorry, commercial kitchen grease disposal. The second ordinance is the introduction of an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Oceanside amending Chapter 29 of the Oceanside City Code by the amendment of Sections 29.130, and 29.131.2 subdivision 12, and the addition of sections 29.144.8 and 29.155 to modify regulation of discharge into the city sewer system. Finally, the third ordinance is an introduction of the ordinance of the City Council of the City of Oceanside, repealing chapter 37, article two, division one, section 37.37.1 .37 of the Oceanside City Code to remove a duplication in the code and amending chapter 37, article two, division two, by the amendment of sections 37.56 to modify meter sizes. Do you want to repeat that? <laughs> <laughs> Please vote. Motion approved, 4-0. Thank you. So our next item is the City of Oceanside Medical Marijuana Ad Hoc Committee report. The report will be done by my council aide, Mr. Don Green, who just brought in 35 pounds of materials. <laughs> this did not cost us any additional money. He's already being paid to do his job, and he did this on time he was being paid to do. He has done a complete report. This is about a half inch thick, and I just want everybody to know that currently, medical marijuana is legal in the state of California. In 10 days, or 11, recreational marijuana will be legal in the state of California. We're not here to change state law one way or the other. We are here to regulate businesses that go on within the city of Oceanside. And what Mr. Green is going to explain, which you will see up here on the screen, is that we have taken steps by using due diligence and research and listening to the community and to business people and to the police officers in our city and to other agencies, including the state of California, to create laws through the city attorney's office that are legally enforceable laws. And just in case there's any confusion, right now as we speak here in Oceanside, there's an app online you can get called weed maps currently at this moment there are 48 mobile delivery operations going on in oceanside and carlsbad that is 46 of whom are illegal two of them are legally registered with the city of oceanside or at least the second one is in the process of being legally registered this is what we're after we're after shutting down these illegal operations but we can't do it without our regulations being in place so if you want to stop the proliferation of marijuana throughout the city of Oceanside, we have to create regulations that stop this. We've already had contact with the people who run this app. They're willing to tell us who these people are so that we can advise them they need to get licenses or they need to stop operating. So please, Mr. Green, continue. Thank you. Good evening, Deputy Mayor Lowry, Council Members. Uh, as was stated, my name is Don Green. I am the aide to Deputy Mayor Lowry. I'm also- I'm sorry, point of clarification. How much time is this? Is this a three-minute item or a 10-minute item? 
presentation. Presentation. Each each council member gets ten minutes. So how much does a council aide get? Three minutes. It's a presentation. Presentation doesn't matter what it is. Okay. Council members get ten minutes. I'm not going to. You know, I'm not interested in getting into an argument. Thank you. We don't want to have a code section that details staff reports, so it's in the discretion of the chair. Please continue. Thank you. That's what's happening. We're going to hear it all. My name is Don Green. I'm the eighth Deputy Mayor Lowry. I'm also the clerk of the Medical Marijuana Ad Hoc Committee. Um, with us tonight are members of the ad hoc committee um, seated at the dais are uh, the chair, Deputy Mayor Lowry, and Council Member Kern, as well as uh, to my left, to your right, to your right, uh, you've heard from patient advocate Gloria Ryan, as well as Dr. Wendy Will, and also uh, Dr. Tricky, our city treasurer, was on the committee as well. Um, tonight, we are here to recommend to the City Council that it receives our report and our recommendations concerning en enacting cannabis business uh, regulations within the city and then forward these recommendations to uh, appropriate staff and advisory boards and commissions for reviews and comments, which will be brought back to Council, uh, hopefully for adoption at a later date. Uh, where how we got here on April 19th the City Council established the ad hoc committee uh, to explore possible regulations for medicinal cannabis businesses in Oceanside we met multiple times over the course of our six-month charter and our last committee meeting was on October 6th to finalize the presentation that you have before you today a little background, uh, Proposition 215 was passed in November of 1996, which legalized medicinal cannabis use in the state of California. More recently, November of 2016, Proposition 64 was passed by the state allowing for adult non-medicinal cannabis use or recreational cannabis use. Uh, coincidentally, 57% of the voters of the state of California approved it and 57% of the voters of Oceanside approved it as well. Uh, SB 94 was a budget trailer bill that was signed by the governor, which combined the regulations of Proposition 215 and Proposition 64. And those caused all the pro proposed rules from the three different state agencies that were responsible for cannabis oversight to be retracted and rewritten. Uh, AB 133 was a legislative bill which was signed at the end of the legislative session this year that uh, further uh, changed and uh, refined the rules for cannabis businesses in the state. And then as recently as last month, the three agencies responsible for cannabis businesses in the state released their revised rules uh, after the changes that were required by SB 94 and AB 133. There are some changes that um, that will be made if this if this item does get forwarded on to the regula regulatory bodies or the advisory commissions. Um, some nomenclature changes that were introduced by the Ca uh, Bureau of Cannabis Control. Um, so some new licensing, but the presentation that you have before you is strictly what the ad hoc committee worked on and came up with. So over the six month period that we met, we held eight different public meetings. The various topics that were covered were cultivation, banking and finance, testing and testing laboratories, dispensaries, manufacturing, distribution, public safety, and we also had public comment meetings. We met uh, uh, about 13 times, it may have been 14, but we met approximately 13 times for organizational type meetings. Our committee toured existing licensed operating facilities, cannabis operating facilities, to gain first-hand information and experience so that we could see what was going on. We reviewed all the changes in state laws and kept on top of how those changes would in fact our local regulations. We reviewed our own local zoning ordinances and our municipal code to see what changes would, be need, would need to be made. We met with staff to understand the full impact of what our recommendations would have on the city as a whole. And with all of that, with all of that work, we have arrived at our current recommendations and we believe that these are really the best path forward for the city and for the patients who rely on medicinal cannabis for some relief. 
There are three areas of considerations, and there's a lot of information to throw at you over a six-month period, but the three major consideration areas are vertical integration. We're going to talk about that. We'll talk about the types of uses, both medicinal and adult use, and the differences there. And then we're going to talk about regulated versus non-regulated uses. And um, we'll, we'll get into those as we talk about the licensing. Uh, the first consideration is vertical integration. The state, with the approval of uh, SB 94 and further clarified under AB 133, allowed for vertical integrated businesses in one facility. So a license holder for one type of business can apply for and is allowed to have various state licenses for different uh, cannabis uses or cannabis businesses within the same facility. Based upon that, our committee is recommending that we remove the use separation requirements that are found in Article 36 of our city zoning ordinances for vertically integrated operations. The exceptions to those, uh, to that, or to those ex um, exemptions, would be for testing laboratories and for retailers. Uh, by state law, testing laboratories need to be independent and third party, so there can be no, um, no one can, uh, a, a manufacturer cannot own a testing laboratory and have it vertically integrated. And although there are provisions in state law that allow for some uh, businesses to have a manufacturer cultivation and retail component, we believed as a committee that we wanted to keep retailers separate within the city. So no retail would be, would be, a sta um, would be vertically integrated, only standalone businesses would be allowed for retailers and testing laboratories. The t types of licenses that we have, with SB 94, the regulations for medicinal and adult use cannabis uh, were combined and streamlined. Uh, the difference uh, essentially is a letter designation within the alphanumeric type of license, A being for adult use or recreational cannabis, and M being for medicinal. We recommend for licensees which are in the supply chain, meaning cultivators, manufacturers, distributors, and that, that both M and A type licenses be allowed. So rec uh, medicinal and also adult use would, types of licenses would be allowed for there. The availability of these, ver with the availability of vertical integration and the lack of difference essentially in the operation of medicinal versus an adult use supply stream. Basically a cultivator is going to grow a plant, uh, whether it is used for medicinal use or uh, recreational use uh, is that's down the supply chain and actually is determined at the retail location uh, as same same way with a with some certain exemptions but the same way with a manufacturer and a distributor those products are going to be sold in the supply chain to either a medicinal use or for an adult use so we believe that to expand the opportunity you've heard some of our uh, farmers in Morrow Hills talk about the need for a new crop with expanding from for, do, for both a medicinal and an adult use availability there, we would expand that market and we'd be able to have more businesses, more successful businesses come into the city of Oceanside. Types of uses, um, for our purposes, we will be talking about regulated versus non-regulated uses. That is a strictly an internal designation that we have here in the city, and it's based on two factors. Uh, the amount of product, the actual amount of cannabis that would be in a specific location, and also the amount of the tetrahydrocannabinol, or the THC, which is the psychoactive agent found in cannabis. Both of those, um, for the non-regulated uses that we'll talk about in just a moment, there would be very low amounts of product and very low amounts of THC on hand. So those would be non-regulated versus those that would have a lot. So I, and I just got through saying that, our regulated use licensees would be required to obtain a conditional use permit uh, with full review as a regulated use under Article 36. So each licensee would be required to undergo a planning department approval 
um, a review and an approval by the Planning Commission, and then a final review and approval by the City Council before being able to go into business. The non-regulated use licensees would be required to obtain an administrative conditional use permit, which would be an approval by the planning staff and a full review by the planning staff. So they would be able to look at things like groupings and <coughs> proliferation of a certain type of business, or if, if a business that wanted to go into a particular area just didn't fit that area, our planning staff staff would be able to stop that at that particular moment or at that level. So for cultivation, this is a regulated use. We'll talk about some of the regulated uses. Cultivators will be allowed, depending upon the type of license that they apply for, to grow a maximum square footage of canopy space of cannabis. So that is the leaf, the, the leaf uh, area that, that's taken up. So for a type one license, which, and again, this is the nomenclature that has been changed. Uh, so they're not exactly type one anymore. They're, they're specialty or small, uh, but they would be allowed to up to 5,000 square feet of either indoor or mixed light use. So indoor would mean strictly with grow lights and no outside lighting. Mixed light would be a combination of sunlight and, and uh, grow lights or indoor. We are recommending that no outdoor growth be allowed at all for this. For a type two license, you would be allowed up to 10,000 square canopy feet or square feet of canopy, both again for indoor or mixed light. And then a type three license would allow up to 22,000 square feet, uh, uh, both indoor or mixed light. On the horizon, there will be type five licenses or whatever name that they will be. They will be available in 2023, and that will have no cap on the actual square footage. So we would recommend uh, at this time that uh, with that in mind that we would need to revisit those types of licenses uh, when their availability comes, uh, comes forward. And cultivation would only be allowed, the CUPs would only be granted in an agricultural zone, so the A zone in our, in our zoning area. The next type of regulated use we'll talk about is distribution. The distributors are the middle step in the process from cultivation to retail. They accept the product from a cultivator uh, when it is harvested, get it tested, process it, get it to a manufacturer, or move it into a retail location. Or once it has been manufactured, they will move it into a retail location. They are also the tax collector on, for the state on both cultivation tax and retail excise taxes. So they will be collecting all of that. They will have li uh, relationships with the Board of Equalization. They will have tax uh, resale licenses and tax collection licenses, and they will be responsible. Uh, the state is collecting a cultivation tax of $9.25 for dry ounce of flour. $2.75 for a dry ounce of trim, or just the leaves. And then the retail, there is a 15% excise tax on all sales. So they will be collecting those. They're responsible for testing of product to meet state guidelines. Uh, all products that at, at different phases. So when um, marijuana has been harvested from a cultivator, it goes into a distributor and it is tested there. Uh, the, the lab comes and collects a sample from uh, the batches and then tests it and then produ produces a certificate which is given back to the distributor. Also when uh, products like edibles or uh, topicals or any of those other types of product uh, extractions, any other type of product, come back, they will be also tested to meet state guidelines. Oops, there we go. Uh, they will store products, uh, both the manufactured and or flour, for distribution to retailers. And we would allow those, we would recommend those to be allowed in the limited, it says light, but it should be limited and general industrial zones. That would be the IL and IG zones only. The next regulated use would be manufacturing. The manufacturers process cannabis from cultivation into products which are used or consumed in manners other than smoking. So edibles, extractions, those type of things. We would only allow the manufacturers to process extractions with non-volatile substances. You can, there are different ways to extract the THC or CBD from cannabis. 
You can use uh, volatile liquids like butane or alcohol, those type of substances. We would, dis we would not allow those. There are cold pressing, there, there's all different ways of extracting it. So only the non-volatile substances would be allowed. These manufacturers will be inspected by the state and county departments of health and would need to meet those, uh, those departments of health standards. They would be regularly inspected by the departments of health and we would recommend that they be allowed only in the limited or general industrial zones, the IL or IG zones there. So retailers uh, probably are, uh, are uh, best or are the face of our, our regulated uses. Um, these are dispensaries nowadays are much improved uh, over a previous image of what a pot shop or a head shop is, uh, much like our um, tattoo businesses that we have in the city that we've cleaned up and we have uh, businesses like the uh, tattoo museum that is on mission right now, which is a very uh, nice, clean, respectable looking business. Uh, so are the dispensaries of today. They have more of a uh, medical office, a more professional look to them. So for our retail businesses, we would recommend that there be one per 40,000 residents, which would currently allow for a total of four. We would recommend that operating hours are restricted from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. That they would need to meet all state and local requirements for security. That vertical integration would not be allowed for a retailer, as we stated before. All concerned parties, meaning owners and employees, would be subject to background checks annually at the time of license renewal. They would be allowed in the limited or general industrial, the IL or IG zones, as well as they would also be allowed in the highway-oriented special commercial, which is CSHO, and the commercial center CC zones. These zones were selected because um, medicinal patients will sometimes need public transport, use of public transportation to get to a dispensary. These particular zones uh, have public transportation access to them, as well as um, a lot of traffic from, from the surrounding neighborhoods in them to create a safer environment. It's great to go into a, a limited or a general industrial zone during the day, but once uh, nighttime falls, it might be a little intimidating or it might be a little more hazardous for a uh, medicinal patient to go into that. So we have uh, recommended that they be allowed into those two particular commercial zones as well. Uh, for all of our regulated uses, uh, none of these regulated uses will be recommended to go um, across the five. Nothing will be allowed west of the five for regulated use. So two of our non-regulated uses, uh, first will be testing laboratories. All products, as was stated before, whether it's harvested flour or manufactured products, must be tested to meet strict state guidelines by an independent ISO or IEC 17025 accredited laboratory. Come on. There we go. So the testing standards are set by the state of California. Uh, currently, a test uh, and the degree to which a product is tested is basically determined by the person who is requesting the testing. That will end as of January 1st. So all testing must be uh, met by the, the strict standards that the state of California have put into place. We're allowing the, we're recommending these to be allowed, uh, testing laboratories allowed in the limited in, uh, and general industrial use, the ILIG zones, as well as the community commercial, general commercial, and highway oriented special commercial zones, so CC, CG, and CSHO zones. These are not places, these are not storefronts, so these are not places where public will be walking in at any given time. Uh, as we said before, when products are needing to be tested, they will have people who will leave the particular testing area, will go to a distributor, will collect a sample, and will bring the sample back to the testing lab. Once that, once that 
sample has been tested. If any material is left over, it is chemically treated to remove all THC from it and then is disposed. So there will not be a, an abundance of product there, nor will there be an abundance of actual THC in there. So that's why we are recommending it to be a non-regulated use and in those areas to be allowed. The second non-regulated use that we are recommending allowed is our nurseries. Nurseries are designed to cultivate uh, either seeds or cloned plants for use by cultivators. So these are the people that uh, get the seeds ready to be planted by farmers or they start the seeds or they start cloned plants and grow them to a point where they would be sold off to cultivators to plant. No production cultivation will take place. Uh, in the nurseries. Our recommendations are operations which are less than a thousand square feet would be allowed in the CC, CG, and CSHO zones. Any opera all operations, no matter what size, would be allowed in the agricultural zones. And many nurseries, uh, many of the nurseries are in the business of tissue propagation, uh, and that's to preserve and clarify strains of cannabis and would only need a small amount of space, so hence the less than 1,000 square foot um, different categories. By far, uh, public safety was the greatest aspect of the committee's work. Uh, we heard from a number of speakers about the need for public safety. Uh, and especially after the problems that the state of Colorado has experienced. Uh, the state of California has learned from the mistakes both of Colorado and from many of the other uh, jurisdictions and states that have uh, legalized cannabis. And they've issued very, very strict rules and very comprehensive measures which will mitigate, uh, if not eradicate, many of the problems that have developed. So. With, with a license application, a security plan must be submitted, and the security plan must include uh, all of these particular items. They must, they must include a video surveillance plan, so 24-7 recording of every square inch of a facility must be uh, provided for, and those, that video surveillance must be stored for up to 120 concurrent hours for review. Um, when we visited a cultivator, uh, uh, an operation in Santa Isabel, the test that was told to us is the inspector will go into an area, take a, an object, whatever that object is, and will throw it somewhere into the facility and then we'll go to the cameras and the camera will need to find that object. If the camera cannot find the object, then they are uh, out of compliance and there will be fines for that. So a video surveillance system must be in place. Uh, an alarm system must be in place, both interior and exterior sounding alarms on all points of entry. And this must be operated and monitored by a state licensed third party security company. So um, if you read about the most currently licensed uh, business that uh, happened in San Diego, the first recreational license that was issued, uh, they had some problems finding a security company that actually wanted a cannabis business as a customer. So it's not going to be as easy as just calling up ADT or somebody and, and getting it. So um, they are required to have an alarm system monitored. Signage, exterior signage will of course meet all current sign ordinances uh, by the city. And exterior signage will include prohibited area, demarcation of prohibited areas, and that video surveillance warnings and video surveillance is in, is in um, taking place. Lighting, all lighting will be illuminated during the evening hours and will meet all of our city lighting standards. Commercial grade locks, all entrances will be equipped with commercial non-residential grade locks. And on-site security, all businesses will have 24-7 on-site security staff unless otherwise approved by our chief of police. So our, our if, if I, I would assume that if a, a nursery or a testing lab makes a compelling case to our police chief that they don't need 24-7 security, then that might be uh, granted. Along with the uh, security plan that was established by the state and is included in our recommendations, uh, all businesses must uh, are required to participate in the track and trace system, which is developed by the state of California. 
This system tracks cannabis activity, all cannabis, uh, cannabis activity, from the time of planting to the time of sale at, at a retail location. And each, uh, it's all tracked with unique identifying numbers. As data is collected, automatic, the, the track and trace system automatically detects anomalies, and those will, be, those will trigger automatic audits by state agencies and local agencies. All the records are accessible by state and local law enforcement at any time, and that will help in investigations and any discrepancies or anything along those lines. Just to show you some of, the, some of what this will look like, uh, the image on the left is a plant which has been um, which has been moved into a greenhouse and is it is now considered a plant in cultivation. Each plant is given that tag which has a unique identifying number. That number tra follows that plant all all through the system. Uh, it records the weight. It records the weight uh, at time uh, before drying, at, at harvest, after drying. It records all of the waste that is generated from the plant. If, it, if not all the plant is used, how much waste is generated. Everything is entered into that system, which is on the right. That is a, per, a screenshot of a, um, a, a software that is used by the particular company that is out in Santa Isabel. Uh, there are various software um, companies that produce a product that will integrate with the state. So once that is entered into the system, every step is the full life cycle of the plant is monitored. As I said, all the waste and all the product is tracked and the information is sent directly to the state of California and can be monitored by all of our local agencies. Any discrepancies or obvious anomalies, if after a, after a harvest or two, if we suddenly see that there's a, a less of a harvest that is recorded, that will automatically trigger an audit. If there any, any type of uh, anomaly there will um, trigger some type, of, uh, some type of investigation by the state and potentially local agencies. And, and as I said, it follows the, the plant throughout its entire life all the way to the retail sale. So once the plant has been harvested, and whether it's a, a, f a flower product that is bought uh, for consumption in a retail space, or if the cannabis is sent to a manufacturer and manufactured into some other type of product, uh, it will be given this. This is a, uh, an example of a, of a tag that was uh, issued in the county of Humboldt. Uh, once that is that uh, QR code is scanned, that gives the information from who bought it to who who grew it, who manufactured it, who who tested it, everything. All the information is found by scanning that QR code. The benefits to this uh, to this program are numerous. Some of them are, again, accountability and handling products correct, correctly and ethically. As all of these tags are scanned along the, along the way, again, once there is, anomaly, there is an anomaly detected by the system, it will generate an audit. So if you have an employee who is skimming product or taking product and taking it out of an environment without registering it through the system, there will be an audit. Public health considerations can be addressed more rapidly if there is a product Product with a particular strain or a batch of marijuana, for whatever case, uh, some some testing didn't detect a, a a pesticide or something that was there for for whatever reason. Instead of having to go through the long process of finding patient zero. Um, we can just scan that information and we know exactly which farm it came from, which testing facility tested it, which manufacturer manufactured it, and we can go to those places and inspect them and find out if there's a problem in their chain. Illegal use of products can be traced to the purchaser of the products. So uh, if for some reason, if somebody got a hold of this illegally and left that tag on um, and one of our police officers got a hold of that, they could scan that tag and find out who the purchaser of the product was. So if medicinal cannabis got into the hands of a youth um, and it was still there, we could find out who the parents were or whoever the per person was that purchased it and provided it to the youth. And as well as discrepancies and skimming of products, as I said, can be traced and corrected before becoming a major issue. I want to talk a little bit about the, to finish, about the efficacy of the city bans that we have in place. 
Currently, we have two bans in place prohibiting the cultivation, manufacturing, and sale of medicinal and adult-use cannabis. And they will stay in place at January 1st, 2018, uh, if this body decides to move forward or not, that will, they will stay in place. With the new regulations that are coming online in, in January 2018, which is the sale of adult-use cannabis, uh, it currently is legal now. Adult-use cannabis is legal. It was legal when Prop 64 was uh, enacted by the voters of the state of California. But starting in January 2018, we'll be able to issue licenses and actually purchase it from sellers. The efficacy of the bans that we have in place with these new regulations are called in, are seriously called into questions. Uh, as we speak, uh, there's a petition effort collecting signatures to overturn our bans. Uh, if we take no action tonight, it is quite possible that our bans have a life expectancy of could be five months, could be 11 months. Whenever a petition reaches the threshold needed, uh, it will go onto the ballot and we've lost all control that we assumed that we had. Adult use cannabis is, as I said, already legal and would become more prevalent in January of 2018. Uh, the state allows for gifting, uh, gifting of and possession of up to an ounce of cannabis flower or up to eight grams of extracted product. That could be wax, shatter, crumble, uh, rolls, whatever, whatever it is that you have. Um, and that gifting means that as long as no money is exchanged, I can, if I grow product in my home, then I can give my friends up to an ounce of that. This is where adult use, this is where recreational cannabis use is going to be um, proliferate. The, the proliferation of it will be through this product. Medicinal cannabis will not uh, be through this. Uh, anecdotally, in the city that I live in, Escondido, um, at a home that I've driven by, I can't tell you how many times, just over the past weekend, uh, the back gate to their property was open and a large banner said free meds 21 plus so they were uh, Presumably a lot of folks got together with their homegrown medicine and as long as no money was exchanged They were anybody that walked in was able to get up to an ounce of marijuana from this from this particular agency uh, I was at a party in Fire Mountain over the holidays and someone was walking around handing out samples of flower product to everyone that was there because it is currently legal and this is where this is where the proliferation of adult use will be and this is not what the medical marijuana ad hoc committee was was put together for we cannot provide enough medicine through adult through grow growing six plants there's no way that a patient can can get enough of the product to do that so we need to provide a safe, reliable, and regulated source for the medicines that are needed. Personal production, as I said, is incapable of providing sufficient quantities of product for medicinal use. And without the available source, the pa our patients are forced to use unregulated, untested, and unsafe products delivered to them by unregulated, unsafe, and you know potentially pretty shady delivery drivers. We had uh, many anecdotal reports during our during some of our hearings of uh, delivery drivers delivering baggies of very very questionable material, whether it was you know to the point where no. Nobody knew exactly what it was. So with that, uh, the face of the cannabis industry is changing. People are no longer going to get their cannabis from shady backroom illegal dispensaries hidden in industrial centers or in the outskirts of cities. You're going to get cannabis now from your friend who spent the money to install a grow room in their spare bedroom. And while this is great for adult use, uh, medicinal patients cannot rely on this, on this type of product to provide the quantity and the quality of what they need. Um, medicinal patients, about 80 to 85 percent of them use products other than smoking to receive their medicine. They use topicals, they use edibles, they don't smoke the product. So they will not be able to get those types of products from adult use, uh, from people that grow a few plants in their backyard. They will be unable. And a lot of them use non-psychoactive CBD-based products, which are non-psychoactive, don't have the THC in them. Again, they will not be able to get those types of products from people who are growing it in their backyard. 
So, as I documented before, the vast majority of medicinal cannabis users, again, uh, use other means. So topicals, edibles, um, that's why with the recommendations of our committee, we feel are very important. So with that, again, we are asking that you receive our reports and our recommendations, that you forward those along to appropriate staff and advisory boards and commissions for their review and comments, and then have those be brought back to council for hopeful adoption at a later date. And I'm available for questions. Thank you. That was pretty thorough. <laughs> I had a series of uh, messages from a friend who is an attorney and he probably had 10 highly relevant questions. He is here in the room and he hasn't asked any questions yet. But I think that you covered all the basics that we've covered and that huge binder that he has over there is all the state regulations that changed. Initially the binder was a small one and now it's up to a very large one. And the state has continued to put out more and more regulations that are trying to be, they're trying to be more specific, but it causes us to have to change our regulations. Just so people understand, if we implement a uh, process that's a result of an initiative, we have to stick with whatever the initiative says. If we initiate a process that is a result of the city council decision, we can alter that result at any time just by putting it on the council agenda and going through the same process that we do to make any kind of regulation. So uh, an initiative is not a panacea for a situation that requires that we make a decision. So anyway, thank you for being so thorough with that. I'm certain it took hundreds of hours and you were paid a tremendous bonus. <laughs> I receive free things in the snack machine. Oh yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Public comment. Yes, we'll continue with the public comment. As previously mentioned, uh, we have two podiums. You can line up at both. Green means go. Yellow, you'll have one minute left. And when the red light hits, if you could wrap up your comments, that'd be appreciated. Our uh, next four speakers are Matthew Dunton, Dennis Cisneros, Sarah Baidu, and Diane Strader. Good evening. My name is Matthew Dunton. For the past several months, I've been in attendance to the ad hoc committee meetings and have seen tremendous progress moving forward with an ordinance that will benefit both the city as well as its residents. The city has dedicated countless hours to put together a working ordinance that should have opportunity to do so. As a local business owner and a resident, I feel our tax dollars can be allocated to more important things in the city, such as its schools, <laughs> instead of a voter initiative that will produce the same results as what the ad hoc committee has been trying to do. Thank you. Good evening, Deputy Mayor and City Council members. My name is Sarah Beto. I am a state licensed administrator. I own an RCFE, that's a residential care facility for the elderly. It is also a state licensed facility. We specialize in hospice and dementia. I am here to support, support the growing elderly population. There is a huge and rapidly growing elderly population as the baby boomer generation retires. Elderly residents experience sundowning behaviors. Most of these sundowning behaviors are treated with medications that have severe side effects. Cannabis is a wonderful alternative to other medications with harsh side effects. I have hospice end of life patients where morphine doesn't work. If they can't swallow or inhale, they need manufactured CBD or THC, which are lotions, drops, creams. What do you tell the patient crying in pain, dying a horrific death? I'm sorry, there's no way for me to get you the medication that you need. The morphine's not working. 
We have physicians writing patients prescriptions for medications, medications we can't get them. I've had family members try to obtain their end-of-life family members prescribed medications. They had to go into homes with men dressed in all black holding machine guns. Delivery, they are not sure the quality and most of these products the prescribed, the prescription doesn't cover. The doctors write very detailed prescriptions. We can't get those prescriptions from a delivery person. There's no way to get them the medication that they need. I would like to obtain a safe retail distribution environment where elderly patients and the patient's family can obtain their medications. Medications that have been tested for accuracy, dosages, and are free of chemicals. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Uh, Mr. Don Green, thank you for the uh, excellent speech. And um, I know we have a very long night ahead of us, so I'm just going to keep it simple. If I'm hoping that the uh, Council tonight votes in favor of the recommendations of the Ad Hoc Committee, and that's really all i got to say. Thank you. I'm Diane Strader. I am from the east side. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner by profession, and you already heard the young people speak. Uh, I hope that this time around no council member puts on their website derogatory tones towards our young people. These folks are well informed, and I believe in some cases even better informed about the research that is going on with uh, cannabis and the teenage or the adolescent brain. Um, so as well as everything that's been presented, the one thing that has not been presented well is how we protect our children. You said if they kept the tag on the, on the plant, you could go back. What happens if that tag disappears? You have no way to find out where it came from or what happened. Just like alcohol is given to children, we do routine checks by putting young people and trying to buy liquor. There are still people who don't ID them or they get somebody else who has the correct ID to buy it and then it's given to them. I see this no different than alcohol and what goes on with alcohol. I understand pain. I just had two major surgeries in five weeks. I was in excruciating pain. I couldn't turn myself over without somebody turning me over. Yes, I was on opioids. Um, and no, I didn't get addicted. I think it has to do with mindset. I took the pain medication as needed. But the whole time I'm taking it, I'm thinking, I need to be off of this because I am not who I am while I'm on this medication. I truly, truly appreciated that I had the medication while I was in pain, but I also recognize that I can help regulate my pain with my own mind. Yes, there's some exceptions, but I'm concerned not so much with the medical side of it, but with the recreational side of it. So I commend both Councilwoman Sanchez and Councilman Jack Feller for their stand on this issue. Thank you so much. Our next four speakers are our next four speakers are Timothy Broom, Sam Humied, Kristen Johnson, and Kelly McCormick. All right, my name is Timothy Brooke. People who enjoy drugs do so only because the drug covers up the pain of doing it by giving a feeling of numbness or pleasure. In our generation, we face an evil that makes you love it more than your own children and need it more than your own life. 
We face an evil that looks at us with a smile as if to say, you're the one who keeps coming back and I'm not so bad, right? Blaming the self for harboring and protecting such an evil and being manipulated to do so. Through one way or another, this evil has inhibited people's morals, thoughts, and emotions upon the very introduction, turning entire cultures and society and societies into ones of ruthlessly ignorant bigots who could care less about millions of people dying in the face of how much their next gram is. I told a man once that if something that was grown, keyword grown, was soil, water, and sunlight is a drug, then so is that bush right there, and my couch even, by that logic, you could argue is a drug, because surely it would change my state of mind and affect my body if I were to smoke it. There needs to be an awakening, a literal enlightenment to the fact that drugs are not only bad, but they have never been good. Is the good found in evil actually good? How are we brought to trust something that has every intention of destroying not just our lives, but those who care for us as well? There is a line between drugs and medicine that has been crossed. It is literally as though the leading medical scientists based all of their research and progress on street drugs, making Adderall out of methamphetamines. Drugs are bad and that's a fact. The truth does not care who is right or who is wrong. It simply exists as a form of indisputable knowledge, and at the end of the day, there is right and there is wrong. No lines, no in-betweens, just good and bad. I would like to tell the council, just personally about my life. I've had a very hard life. I was tortured in a dog cage for 10 years of my life, beaten for breathing. I smoke pot to deal with that. There are psychological needs that marijuana satisfies for me. When I was 16, I suffered from micro hallucinations. Look it up. It's when you see something. It's when you see 18 different frames in less than a second. And they were violent, horrible things. And marijuana helped me to deal with that and overcome it, and I don't suffer from it anymore. Thank you. So our next speakers are Sam Humiad, Kristen Johnson, or Kelly McCormick. You can go for it. Good evening, I'm Kelly McCormick. I'm the parent of two teenagers, the daughter of a Navy veteran, the wife of an Army veteran, and an 11-year fundraiser for the Relay for Life American Cancer Society. And I'm here tonight to make sure the voice of ordinary citizens, parents, and health and safety advocates are heard, since the ad hoc committee was mainly interested in hearing from people who work in the pot industry. It, stay, it says right in the staff report that, quote, they met with industry experts to understand the needs of the businesses involved in cannabis production and sales. You will notice they did not meet with law enforcement officers, public health advocates, school officials, or addiction experts. The ad hoc committee convened with the goal of bringing pot shops and other related marijuana businesses to Oceanside. They did not consider the adverse effects on the community or the unintended consequences. One of the most important unintended consequences is increased pot use among teenagers. We all know that it's very easy to obtain a medical marijuana card. We also know that one of the primary ways teenagers obtain pot is from older friends. When pot is easier to access, there will be more of it making its way to teenagers. Just this week, the Vista Unified School District issued a safety bulletin stating that within the past several weeks, they've observed an increase of students that have been determined to be under the influence of controlled substances, including marijuana, during school hours. It also notes there's been an increase in teens using controlled substances throughout San Diego County. Now, do you really want to bring more pot into Oceanside? with easy access every day from 7 in the morning to 9 at night. 
Commercializing pot also leads to a heavier burden on law enforcement officers, code enforcement officials, social services, hospital emergency departments, and more. All of this has been documented in other states, and I can provide the data in writing if you like. The state gives you the right to say no to commercial pot. I urge you to join the other 70% of California cities and counties that are banning commercial pot businesses. Please take the responsible action of saying no to commercial pot in Oceanside. My name is Kristen Johnson, and I was a federal employee in Oceanside for 31 years and um, didn't do any kind of drugs. Um, now I've been di diagnosed with psoriatic psoriasis, which has been a, a very a big problem. It comes and goes, and it's very hard to figure out what makes it worse. Um, my rheumatologist wanted to give me uh, injections of biologicals, and the side effects on those give you, uh, you can get lymphoma from it, liver damage, uh, you're more susceptible to strokes and heart attacks, and it, your immune system is lowered. So he told me the other alternative was to try uh, marijuana, which I started trying last December, and uh, I haven't had, after I got a reliable source, it, which is a black market source, um, I haven't had any more problems and haven't had to take any kind of heavy duty pills. Uh, I, I have, a, for those, I care about kids too. I raised four kids that turned out to be law-abiding citizens, and I made sure they didn't smoke any marijuana or have drugs because I looked through their rooms, and especially if anything was suspicious. Uh, as it is now, the, the, the uh, weed maps dispensaries that are black market there's scores of them in Oceanside, and I know myself, most of them didn't ask for a medical card at all, nor ID when they got to my house. And the, the people that came have no background checks. You don't even know the name of the company they come from. You just, they just show up at your house. Some come smoking a joint. I, I, don't, I don't like to do, have people in my home and they seem to want to come in your house to do the money exchange. So uh, I tried growing it myself and I went through 12 plants and only two of them lived. The farmers in, in uh, Morrow Hills and other areas need a crop and I don't want to grow that crop so I hope that you'll say yes to the farmers and yes to the patients. Give them a crop that they can survive on and uh, let the rest of us not have to grow it or get it black market. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see everyone. My name is Sam Humid. I am an Oceanside resident. I am the president of Flame and Leaf Collective, a delivery service and collective that serves primarily seniors. Uh, I'm here to recommend that Council Member Sanchez, as busy as you are eating your food, that you pay attention to your constituents, please. Thank you. And uh, recognize that we are here. The Thank you. The 57% in Sanchez. We demand to be heard. Listen to these people speak. They demand to be heard. They demand to be recognized. It's a shame that you sit at that desk and you just ignore us all. There are seniors who are sick. There are people who are dying. There are people suffering from AIDS, cancer, and whatnot. And you sit there callously and cold, ignoring all of us, pretending that you think the Latinos don't want this. Latinos absolutely want this. Most of South America has legalized marijuana at this point. You are way behind the times, Councilman Sanchez. Mr. Chair, point of order. There are some characterizations being made here. Point of order. 
Could bring you ramp, it? Yes. Ramp it down. I'm sorry. So again, I apologize if I upset you, Ms. Sanchez. You've ignored every single one of my phone calls and emails. So this is the only way I can communicate with you. These are the people. These are the voters. Your election is coming up, and you put a hold on to that seat. You know how to do it. Thank you for your time. All right, so uh, prior to our next four speakers uh, getting up, I just want to remind the public that we do have a decorum policy instituted in the city council chambers. So uh, if we could just refrain from uh, directly uh, going after certain council members, and they'll do the same for you. But obviously, it's a democracy. We want everyone to be heard. But just want to remind that we have a decorum policy. That's all. Uh, moving forward to our next four speakers, we have Judy Serrana, Jane Marshall, Kevin uh, at SD Stran Strains, and Michelle McKechnie. Good evening, everyone, council, staff, residents. My name is Jane Marshall. I'm a 30-year resident here in Oceanside. Um, and as a resident, and I'm an active volunteer, and I really try to do all kinds of things to help better Oceanside. So I have to tell you, I struggle greatly with this whole marijuana thing. Why? Because I've seen, you know, close up and personal what it's done to my kids and, and other people that have been negatively affected by it. So when this ad hoc committee began, you know, it was like this huge, really hard effort to go to these committee meetings. Why? Because they're talking about something that I thoroughly disagree with. Yet, at the same time, I had to go and understand the problem. I had to go and understand what the, what the details were so I could make a better informed choice. Um, one of the things that I'm, 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 after a lot of research, a lot of meetings, a lot of online stuff, a lot of personal interviews and talking with many people, I came up to four conclusions. One, although I may seek other treatment, it's been proven again and again that medical marijuana is a valid treatment for anxiety, insomnia, PTSD, um, just a host of things, cancer, pain related, et cetera and in many cases less harmful, as many people talked about, than some of the prescription drugs with less side effects. Makes me nauseous just to smell it, but I understand it works for some people. Also, the negative impact to family and children. You know, it happened to me personally. Yet at the same time, if, I know kids are very resourceful and oftentimes they'll find ways to get stuff even when it is illegal, like drinking, etc. But without them having to go to illegal areas and you know desperate kind of unfortunate areas uh, you know if it was more acceptable like drinking then they wouldn't have had some of the problems that I've had and then this alternative crop idea that was brought up by a couple of people you know I mean there's a big housing uh, multiple use development proposed for the Morrow Hills farmland well this is a natural a, a very rare natural resource that we have and why should we pave it over when there's alternatives like this that help farmers uh, be able to manage their finances and, and have a better uh, living and, and not have to sell out to some of these developers? And finally, this issue with the San Diego Initiative. I read a lot about this Association for Cannabis Professionals, the San Diego group that is trying to force Oceanside to do something. And what's worse, we all went through this districting thing. We don't want other people to tell us how to live. The ad hoc committee went through with all the, the feedback from the community to try to come up with a better proposal. So please, look at it honestly, look at it openly, and I urge you to vote for this ad hoc committee recommendation. Thank you. Good evening. What you're seeing on the screen is the emergency letter that went out from the Vista School District yesterday regarding the amount of marijuana, among other things, that they're finding with their young people and the concern the school district has that we all work together, you'll notice the last paragraph, that we all work together on behalf of our students to make sure that the messages that we're sending to them are about public health and would safety. You, would you state your name? Yes, Judy Strang. 
Thank you. I, I find this a very hostile environment in which to be speaking tonight. I'm speaking on behalf of a parent group that has met from 2004 till now, representing parents and parent groups throughout the county from the 18 cities we meet once a month. We talk about the role of marijuana in each of our cities and in our families, and we talk about the regulations and the bans that are in our cities and how they've been useful or not useful, as the case may be. And there's some observations that we have made. I, first of all, would like to say that I'm sort of appalled that we had a city staff person speak to us for 40 minutes, but we didn't have a counterpoint. Surely that ad hoc committee must have had counterpoint testimony. Where was it? Where are the PTA groups? Where are the parents? Where are the sheriffs? Where are the people? Uh, please, please I think, I, Thank you. I'd just like to say that there are two groups of people represented here, parents, but you have to know that there's a group of cannabis business people who received the email to come to your meeting tonight. And each time there is a city council meeting throughout our county, they do get an email and they do come to these meetings. And it casts a kind of... Oh, please uh, don't interrupt, thank you so much. I know it's difficult when somebody has a different point of view, but I um, did want to point out a couple of things. First of all, Metapot exists. State law allows patients and caregivers to gather together. You do not need regulations in a city for this to exist. Recreational pot is going to exist. You do not need regulations. I think this is a rust to the bank, if you will. I think you need to wait and see what happens with your petition, because the petition is going to preempt anything you do in the way of regulations. And use this time until the next ballot, if your petition comes to the ballot, and make it really clear what that petition is going to do so that your community members are prepared to vote for it appropriately. And I think you need to examine the unintended consequences of what you're considering here tonight. We heard none of that, and I'm offended as a parent and a grandparent. I think it's really unfortunate. I'm offended by the makeup of the ad hoc committee, frankly. I want to know where your PTA groups were. Sorry, I had a lot of other things to say. Thank you. So if the people in the room would just let the people speak. That would be very helpful. We're, I noticed that most people don't interrupt other people, but some people are being interrupted by others. So it would be courteous just to let the person finish before they run out of time because everyone's on the same timer. So thank you. <clears throat> Hello, thank you all for being here. Thanks for all the work you've done. We've got a clearly a di diverse group in the room and a diverse group right up here too. And uh, we've seen people change their minds from their testimony of how they once felt about it. Would you state your name? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, my name is Kevin. I'm a longtime resident of Oceanside and Carlsbad. Kids born on the beach here. And uh, really the theme of my three minute talk here is to keep Oceanside beautiful. I think it's easy to hear all these diverse ideas and it almost sounds like some people think that it's your fault that pot's going to be in Oceanside. It is going to be here and it's actually been here for decades, uh, but it, it will be here and, and there, I can hear it coming out of uh, Deputy Mayor's mouth that it's not his idea to bring pot to Oceanside. I think we can all picture the really ugly side of pot. It's easy to talk about the sign slinger and the raggedy clothes and the neon lights. That's what the, I'm sure the ad hoc committee is going to do with the city to make it a beautiful presentation. Oceanside has always been an edgy town, and it's going to be here. It's not Carlsbad. It's not Del Mar. It's going to be here, and I urge you to make it beautiful. Who's going to make it beautiful? It's not the millionaires from up north that have had a two-year head start on it. I hope you'll seriously consider the locals that love this town because they'll want to present it in a, in a beautiful way. Um, also, like I said, we talk about the dispensaries and how it could be ugly. So many other businesses in the industry that you're inviting. And um, for example, I'm what would be considered a broker. There's not much impact on the community. We work from a desk and we can do really high numbers there from that desk. And unfortunately, just two months ago, seeing how long this was all going to take, I had to get an office in Sorrento Valley. And I'll do those high numbers from Sorrento Valley, and that really bothers me. 
I will. I got a small office. I would like to get a bigger one here in Oceanside. I hope you'll consider the locals that will keep the town presented well in this industry. We don't want our tax dollars to go to some other city. The locals want it here. Um, we are that kind of community. It will be here. We'll make it look good. And that's what you guys are here to do is make those rules. The billboards don't have to be there. The sign slingers don't have to be there. The town doesn't have to smell like weed. One last thing in this 27 seconds, I don't know if it's a, a question necessarily, but I hope it'll be addressed. The agricultural zoning is quite barren of power. And I hope that because you talked about plants not growing outdoors, you'll consider the uh, industrial zone has big warehouses, which are quite set up perfect for that kind of thing. So I hope you don't just keep it in agricultural, the indoor grow. Thank you very much. Good evening. Hi, my name is Michelle McKechnie. I'm the co-operator of 420 Central Delivery here in Oceanside. I want to say thank you to the council members and deputy mayor for constantly giving us your time and your effort to make Oceanside as great as it is. I also urge you to please vote and push forward the ad hoc's recommendation. As somebody that isn't a licensed store already, we look forward to working together. Our goal from anybody in this industry is to not hide under a rock, not to hide, but to have openness and to share what we have. We, what we want to do is bring in all the community groups. We talked about public safety and the concerns that people have. Well, the only way that we're going to overcome them and make anybody feel better is if we work together. And that's what having a license does. We've done it in Santa Ana, ladies and gentlemen. When they first passed their initiative, they were very conservative when they went about it. They reduced the number of hours, the number of dispensaries, things like that. And the city council, as they saw these businesses build over time and they worked together, they realized they weren't the boogeyman, that they were legitimate businesses that deserved to be treated legitimately. And as such, they started re reducing or modifying their regulations. So much so that now Santa Ana is going to be the first recreational city in all of Orange County. They're very proud of that fact. And they're going to continue to make regulations and work with these dispensaries and with these businesses because that's what we do. We go into city we improve the communities that we're in. We gentrify the neighborhoods. We use the money that we have, the tax dollars that are generated, to help with community problems that we have. Again, we work together. The police chief, I go in and personally meet with him because he has to know who I am. I am an employee of 420 Central, and as such, they know who I am, so if they need to come speak with me, I'm there for them. That includes any person who works at 420 Central because, again, we're not hiding. Our goal is to get it off the black market so we can make public safety priority. That's why we have these state regulations. There was so much concern about where the medical cannabis industry was going that the state stepped in and they asked you and then the voters got an initiative and they demanded it. And so I ask you to please legislate progressively, legislate with the will of the people and look at the other cities that have done it and know that we can do it well. It's not something to be afraid of, it's something to embrace. We can all do this together and I ser seriously hope that you vote yes for the ad hoc recommendations and that we move forward and that we continue working together. Thank you for your time. Our next four speakers are Drew Andrioff, Carolyn Bolton, Greg Merig, Marty. oh Marty, sorry about that, okay. and uh, Linda Walshaw. Good evening, Honorable Deputy Mayor and esteemed Council Members. My name is Andrew Michael Andrioff, Oceanside resident, District 1. First, I'd like to extend my gratitude to the Oceanside Firefighters, along with the City's Emergency of Operations Center and other first responders whose efforts minimize the scale and damage of the recent lilac fires. But the reason I'm here today is because Oceanside faces an issue of great importance. As our city continues to grow and progress, we as a community must do so as well. Over the decades, I've witnessed monumental improvements of the downtown area, which once used to be vacant housing and dilapidated buildings, is now a thriving marketplace filled with beautiful new restaurants, craft breweries, and high-end condominiums. However, there is so much to be accomplished. We still have underfunded youth and after-school programs. We still have an approved plan for an aquatic center at El Corazon Park, but no plan for its funding, uh, its construction, or supervision. 
We have an employee pension that is becoming economically unstable, a police department that will require a larger budget to further address the vast homeless population that only grows larger and more problematic, as well as increasing gang violence that continues to interrupt our peaceful coastal town. All of this creates an, economic, an incredible fiscal impact on the operations of our city. During the years in which cannabis has become legal, we have witnessed history repeating itself in the very same fashion as the alcohol industry. Once an illegal and underground model has become a mainstream part of the community, which has been welcomed in many cities hoping to revitalize and produce a much needed influx of revenue. Nevada, Washington, and Oregon have all benefited from a legalized marijuana industry, but none so impressive as the state of Colorado who pioneered this movement. In 2016, Colorado generated $200 million in taxes from the cannabis industry. In Denver alone, the city created $24 million in new revenue from excise and special sales taxes on marijuana, which has allowed them to invest in technology for local schools, increase teacher salaries, and build recreational buildings for community and youth programs. In Aurora, Colorado, the town produced $16 million in taxes from marijuana sales, which helped construct new homeless shelters to house and rehabilitate some of the city's most vulnerable citizens. Towns in Colorado which decided to ban all commercial marijuana activities are now seeing the success neighboring towns are enjoying and they are regretting their decision. I understand the difficult determination you all face, but please do not negate the fact that the majority of your voting constituents favor a legal marijuana industry in Oceanside. As Americans, we pride ourselves as is our patriotic duty to ensure we allow our voices to be heard through a democratic voting process. As elected representatives of the city of Oceanside, you are the ones who are responsible to champion our rights and voices and fight for them to be heard and implemented, regardless of how you may personally view this issue. It is absolutely imperative at this time not to sidestep and shudder, but to rise up and listen to the will of the people, to create and implement a program where we can help the alien patients in North County, where we can legitimize an entire industry and remove the criminal element to make this an enterprise that we can be proud to establish in our city. I implore you all tonight to adopt the ad hoc committee's recommendation and let's work together to ensure that our city maintains control of this industry and is not lost, lost to outside parties via voter initiative. Thank you so much for your time tonight and your continued works and efforts in the great city of Oceanside. So, uh, Merry Christmas. How is everybody? Please state your name. Merry Christmas. My name is Greg Marty. Thank you. 404 via Emily, 4290 via Clemente. Yeah, I own two homes in this city. I love my city. I am the son of a Marine major. I am a three time cancer survivor. The first time I came to Oceanside was 1967. I had survived neuroblastoma in 1965. I had a 7% chance to live. Came back to this town in 1980. I was a two-time cancer survivor. I was part of the United States Army's medical marijuana about how does it affect chemotherapy. Then and again in 1997, when I'm working for Vans on the Warp Tour, as the announcer for the Warp Tour, I got another bout of cancer. So, I own Spectre Distribution. I was part of the distribution, thanks to you did an amazing job. I was part of the, one of the two distributors in the Track and Trace program for the state of California for what's coming. I also own Amethyst Beverage. Amethyst Beverage will be in Walmart. We are the first CBD infused water that will be sold in 3,000 Walmarts. And as of yesterday, 7,700 United States military commissaries will be carrying my water. Right here from Oceanside. Little guy did good. I would have never thought. I, I have detractors. I love, I love my anti-detractors because I want to prove to them that we're doing it right and we're doing it responsibly. You have the ability right now. You have 29 different cities. The mayor of Alianto, the mayor of Paris. I could tell you, Ben could tell you, numerous people that we talk to who eyes are watching you right now. You have the ability to set forth something that everybody will use as the groundbreaking system for what they want to do with marijuana. Now, it's your choice. I implore each and every one of you, I pray to God and I pray to Jesus Christ that he gives you the wisdom to do what's right as the wisdom of our, our city fathers and our city mother and our beautiful manager who has kept our city running strong, our beautiful police chief back there that has to deal with our black market. We're trying to get it better, brother, so you, have, you and your boys have an easier job so you can do the real crimes. So that being said, please, I implore each and every one of you, take a thought. Take a deep breath. Talk to your creator if you have one, whatever it be, Allah, Jesus, God, whoever it is. Talk to them and find out deep within inside your soul if this is the right thing for you and for your city. You are here to be the wisdom of our community. That's why we put you here. We can easily take you out. That's the power of this, this assembly. 
That's the power of this government. As somebody who's lived outside of this country for eight years of his life, I love the United States of America, and I love the city of Oceanside. I graduated high school. I coached at Oceanside for seven seasons. I coached at El Camino for one. Thank you for your time. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Good evening, Deputy Mayor and City Council. Linda Walshaw, a longtime Oceanside resident. Um, if I understand the agenda item tonight, it is simply to pass along the recommendations of the committee to staff and to other boards and commissions for further consideration. I think after attending those meetings and listening to the patients and listening to the experts that came and gave their time and expert testimony that that is the least that we can do with all of the hard work that was put in by this committee is to pass it along for further review and bring it back for further regulation. It's also my understanding that without regulation, then we lose our ability to change things if, if an outside interest group comes in with a petition and passes an ordinance that we didn't pass and we didn't regulate, then we don't have the ability to make changes to it in the future. If there's too many dispensaries allowed or they're in the wrong locations, it's out of our hands after that. So I would l urge everyone involved to look at this carefully and, and make decisions based on our ability to control it. The voters passed marijuana in California. It is what it is, and we're gonna have to decide how we're gonna live with that. But I also keep thinking about the parents who came, who had children that with seizure disorders, and they need cannabis oil, or they need some other form of product. They can't grow that at home and regulate that and make it and manufacture it the way that a pharmacy would do or their doctor prescribe for their child. I cannot imagine being in that situation of having a child with a severe disorder and not being able to get them the medication they need. I too am a cancer survivor, and I, I talk every day to seniors who have uh, problems with opioids, and, and that's the only thing being offered to them by their doctors, and they don't want to be doped up. They want to be able to drive and live their lives and continue to function as much as they can. And I don't like th things being taken out of their hands and, and put in the hands of black market people that are unlicensed and you don't know what you're getting and from whom. I think we need to really look at this and bring this back after it's been reviewed further. And please, I would urge everybody not to sign a petition from outsiders and to keep the regulation in the city of Oceanside. Thank you. Take 10 minutes. We're going to take a 10 minute recess. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes. If anyone else wants to speak who hasn't put in a speaker slip, please take one over to the city clerk.